Okay, so today we will look at some uh, non-idealities of transistors and how they impact uh, circuits, circuit design. Uh, some of these things perhaps, uh, you know, maybe when you are actually doing your own circuit design or maybe later on you might fully appreciate. <coughs> but anyway, let us introduce the topic now and uh, uh, maybe we could revisit a little bit later also in the course uh, as uh, required. So, you know, one of the most important uh, uh, processes inside the transistor is the formation of the inversion layer, because that is what determines and controls the conductivity of the channel and the transistor. So, what was causing the inversion layer to be formed? It was basically the potential on the gate to body, right? If the gate was uh, sufficiently positive with respect to the body for an NMOS transistor, the what happens is the free electrons are attracted and you form a inversion layer that is that surface what was P type before becomes basically N type and that forms a conducting layer between the source gene regions. Now really the major cause for this one of the major cause for these non identities are complexities. Uh, to really to understand that is to kind of see who controls the channel, who controls the formation of the inversion layer. Okay, so ideally you want only one person, the gate to control it, but in reality there are other players who come in and mess up things and that is really all what happens and uh, really complicates the picture. So let us take the first the impact of the body voltage, right. So here what we have is the uh, source to the body we apply a potential and uh, see in the body you have the uh, okay I made a mistake here with the uh, polarity of the charges or the fixed uh, no okay so you have basically the uh, uh, fixed ions out here in the body and uh, you know you can make the body uh, more um, it, you have a essentially you have a depletion region out here right you have the fixed ions and you have a depletion region and when you want to invert the channel you have to basically apply a positive potential to attract the electrons first you have to make it more depleted it's like you have a reverse bias diode right so you cannot make it you up, you know essentially uh, let us say we increase the v source to bulk voltage right the source to bulk voltage so what we do is we increase the depletion region more and so if you now see how much potential is required to invert the channel the gate you have to apply more potential to invert to you know because you have to kind of essentially compensate for this extra depletion region and you have to put more potential to create this inversion region. So essentially what it translates to is that the threshold voltage essentially has gone up because what was getting inverted before at a lower voltage now needs more voltage because you have more of these fixed uh, ions in the channel which you want to compensate. Similarly, if you apply uh, if you reduce the V source to bulk voltage, okay, so normally the source being N and the uh, the body being P, you have uh, you know the, you have a diode out here, right? For an NMOS transistor, the source is N plus, body is P. You have a diode, so you try to forward bias the diode. Okay, so you, that means you reduce the source to body potential, maybe even perhaps make the body positive with respect to the source. Okay, normally what we do is we set the body for an NMOS is connected to ground. And if you take an if you take an NMOS, say this is the source region, if you think of an inverter, the source is also connected to ground. So normal mode of operation is VSB is 0. So the diode N plus P diode has a 0 potential. Now we are saying let us make that potential a little positive. So you kind of slightly forward bias the diode, you reduce the depletion region and so now essentially you can more easily invert the channel. Lesser gate voltage will allow free electrons to accumulate and so essentially your 
reducing the threshold voltage. So what this is saying is that the body also has an impact on the threshold voltage of the transistor, the potential of the body. And you know it can be kind of captured, this is a simple equation which captures it. So you have a nominal threshold voltage and then you have based on the, the source to body potential, you have essentially it's related to the, the, the depletion width and you have a, what is called a body effect coefficient which is oxide thickness T ox by epsilon ox square root 2 NAQ epsilon S and so on. Now if you notice this equation T ox comes in. So if T ox is large, what is T ox? It is the distance of the gate with respect to the channel that is the oxide thickness. T ox is the oxide thickness, epsilon ox is the dielectric constant of the oxide. Okay. So, if T ox is large, that means the gate is farther away. That means the body has more of an effect. So, gamma is larger. This gamma is larger because gate is farther away. As we are scaling down technology, what is happening is T ox is reducing. So, it is good. The gate is becoming closer and closer to the channel. Okay, so the body effect is actually reducing, but of course it also turns out that as we are scaling technology, the Na, the acceptor concentration. So if you, in this equation, Na is something which is in the control of the device designer, Q is just the electronic charge, epsilon s is the directly constant of silicon and phi s is <coughs> essentially related to the work functions of the materials involved. So Na is acceptor concentration, it does go up, but it doesn't, you know, there is a certain limit to which it can go. So really the body effect is kind of reducing as we are scaling down technology which is a good thing. But you know you still see that the substrate voltage has an impact on the threshold voltage of the transistor. Now when you do digital design where does it come into the picture? Let us take we saw a simple inverter. Now what we have here is a NAND gate. A NAND gate has two series transistors. Sorry. It has two series transistors and then in the NMOS and two parallel transistors in the PMOS. So you see out here when A and B both are high, only then Y goes to 0. Okay, So Y is equal to A dot B complement. So it is a NAND function. And this is just a symbol for the NAND gate and this is the equivalent, logically equivalent by applying De Morgan's law where you take the bubble and push it in. When you push the bubble through a gate, an AND becomes or right. So this is the De Morgan's law. Um, it's just a logical representation. Now, if you see this this gate out here, what we typically do in digital circuits, most most of the time, we even in analog circuits also, we basically take the body of the NMOS connected to ground, body of the PMOS connected to VDD. So that is why we never show the body connection in the circuit diagrams. Why? I mean, we know it's always default. So it just clutters the circuit diagram. We never show it. So here the body is connected to ground. So source is also at ground for this transistor, the lower NMOS transistor. So source to body voltage is zero. So it, there is no impact of the body on the threshold of the lower transistor. But you take the transistor above it. The body is connected to ground, but the source potential, it could be we do not know where it is. Right? It really depends on the state of the, if there is no current, for example, you know, when y is 0, this is also 0, so it is fine. But when y is 1 and you are trying to switch and pull down y to 0, as current starts flowing down while it is trying to pull, clearly there will be a potential drop across the lower transistor. Right? When current is flowing down in the transistor connected by B, there has to be some non-zero VDS. That means this potential is above ground what does it mean to the source to body potential it has become positive the n plus in the source and the p of the body have a now a positive potential across it that means the diode has become more reverse bias depletion has gone up essentially threshold goes up so the threshold voltage of this transistor goes up it's not the same as this guy right so it has an impact of slowing down even you even though you use the same you thought it's the same identical transistor but really the current capability of this transistor is lower than that of this guy because the threshold has gone up. 
so essentially it it has it has a uh, implication that it you know from the point of view of speed it reduces the speed of operation because currents have gone down at the same time it's good for leakage we'll we'll study leakage a little bit later in the course again leakage is leakage is re related to the threshold voltage okay so if the threshold voltage is high leakage is less and vice versa so from a leakage perspective it's good to have a higher uh, threshold voltage and you can use the body to control the threshold so that is something which i just want to introduce here in this slide we'll not go into it into too much detail in in this lecture but you know any time you have this as i said an extra control knob maybe there are certain interesting things you can do and so one of the things people have explored is the possibility of changing the body bias in an adaptive way okay if the threshold is high speed is low but leakage is low when threshold is low you know leakage is high but speed is also high so maybe there are times when you want to run really fast so at that time you are you you can be more leaky when there are times when you are quiet where you want to reduce the threshold voltage for example right now in the laptop processor nothing much is really happening so it can run slow so i would like to reduce the leakage but you know as i am trying to save the video or you know doing compression of the video it needs to run fast so it can be leaky yet uh, it will run fast so you can have a controller which generates these body biases and adjust the threshold voltage so this is something which uh, basically uh, a positive way of looking at you know the optimist's view of uh, the impact of body on the threshold voltage so the the mobility remember the equation where the current is of course related to the gate <coughs> overdrive vgt the gate to threshold voltage difference and the relationship has mu the mobility of the carriers the mobility unfortunately is also not a constant it actually depends on the temperature as well as the electric fields out there in the transistor <coughs> in fact not only the lateral electric fields but even the vertical electric fields have an impact on the mobility of the transistor really you can think of it as you have the electrons going through but you know really even though we have shown this channel with a certain depth and so on it's really like a very thin sheet at the surface at the interface between the oxide and the silicon layer at the interface between the oxide and the silicon layer you have what you have done is you have really abruptly cut the nice crystalline structure right everything below was nice crystalline structure at the interface you have cut it because you have put a different material you have put silicon or dioxide right or whatever gate directed you want to put so what that means is your bonds are dangling you might have you know certain things trapped there hydrogen whatever so what that leads to is essentially the kind of a naive naive way or maybe a kind of a simplistic way of thinking of it it's a rough surface so there is no this flow of electrons is not smooth the stronger the electric field vertical electric field the stronger it gets attracted to the surface it keeps bouncing more right so it becomes impeded even more so the mobility degrades due to larger electric field okay just a caveat the notion of roughness is just as an analogy okay but you know really you have to look at it from the point of view of energy loss you know there are some quantum mechanics there are basically states energy states to which these electrons can have lose their energy and so on but basically you the 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 mobility degrades due to stronger electric fields and there is some you know uh, model for that which is if you see out in this equation the vertical electric field is you know you have vgs and the t ox comes in right potential divided by the distance is the electric field right so that comes in and the, the bigger the electric field lower is the mobility so uh, so the mobility is a function of the electric field so if you go back to those equations that equation now has become even more complex what we thought was a constant is actually a function of vgs mu is the function of vgs you also have this problem of velocity saturation right so you know when we when we derive the equation for the current for the transistor the simplistic level zero equation you know we had to 
essentially calculate the amount of charge in the channel, which we said C aux times the area is the charge, WL. And then we said, how long does it take for the charge to go from source to drain, which is essentially the velocity divided by the distance. Right? That is the time. Velocity, we said, is linearly related to electric field, mu times C. That relationship holds when the electric fields are low, but as the electric fields go beyond a certain value, the velocity starts saturating. And there are different numbers, holes and electrons have different saturation velocity. So really the velocity becomes no longer E, uh, mu times E, but it is mu effective times some more complicated equation out here, where EC is like a critical <coughs> field. Okay, so, um, so less than E, less than the critical field, you have this equation where for low E it is linear and then it slowly bends over and for E larger than the critical electric field it is, there is an upper limit, it, the velocity does not exceed that. <coughs> so what that means is that, you know, when we go back to our equation for the current, right, say you have a transistor where as soon as you turn on the transistor and you try to discharge, say you have an inverter the output of the inverter is high, you turn on the NMOS and the output wants to fall. As soon as you turn it on, VDS is VDD. It's like the full voltage, it's across the VDS. So it's a very high electric field. So what is the current the, at that point, right? So now since the electric field is very high and it's beyond the critical field, especially with the modern transistors, the, the transistors have become so tiny that, you know, you essentially exceed that critical field. So your velocity is very close to velo saturated velocity. So now my current is basically charge C aux WL times the gate overdrive VGT. L is not here, it will come into the picture. Times the time required to transit. Transit time is essentially V by L. Right? So that is the transit time. And uh, so you basically end up with this equation. You see, notice that the current is independent of channel length. So I can make a slightly longer channel, at least according to this equation, the current is not going to change too much. So, so this is the extreme, that the velocity is just pinned to Vmax, no matter what drain source voltage you use. This is the other extreme, the first equation, which is the long channel model, where you have this quadratic dependence. Okay, that's what we had derived earlier. And real transistors are somewhere in between. And remember that VDS is also changing. It's not as as the transistor as the output of the inverter starts falling down, VDS is changing. So it's not a fixed VDS. So it kind of goes from fully velocity saturated to partial, etc. etc. So really what happens is that you know in some sense you're somewhere in between these two regions. And there is a way to model it. So instead of this gate overdrive being coming in as a power of two, and here it just comes in as a power of one. You see out here VGT square VGT. So the exponent of VGT is either 2 or 1 in the two extremes. So in reality, a better model is the exponent is some alpha between 1 and 2. Okay, so that you empirically determine and you can fit and so on. So that is called the alpha power law model. So in the alpha power law model, you have this, uh, it's kind of written this slightly more complex way, but basically you have Cutoff is the same, VGS less than VT, that is VGT is less than 0, there is no current. In the linear region, this region, again, you have IDS proportional to VDS. And in the saturation region, you have ID sat, where ID sat depends on VGT to the power of alpha. So you end up with these currents, which are, you know, the, the other thing out here is that the, the currents are lower than what you would have predicted with the square law model. They are lower because the exponent is no longer 2 but less than 2. So you, are, you kind of lost a little bit on the drive strength capability. Another problem which occurs is channel length modulation. Basically, as for very large VDSs, as, as, a, as my VDS increases, this channel length is no longer kind of the, the region, the inverted region is not of fixed length, but it reduces because, you know, 
and because you know essentially this this diode is becoming more and more reverse biased so you are increasing the depletion region so this pinch off region is kind of becoming larger and larger so when channel length modulates effectively l which appears in the equation reduces and uh, you know <coughs> again this is a simple way of capturing that for very small uh, modulations in the channel length you have a saturation current which is modulated by this factor 1 plus lambda vds okay where lambda is a technology dependent <coughs> parameter so you know these equations you should remember they are not like gospel truth they are a way of representing and capturing to the you know because there is a requirement of simplicity especially when you want to do some hand calculations and be able to understand um, so they try to approximate the physical situation right um, of course more comp you know if you really want to do very accurate simulations the equations become very very complex and uh, there is a whole kind of you probably have a career in just modeling compact modeling of transistors and you can be very gainfully employed by a lot of these semiconductor companies because these models are really the way by which the device designer and the foundry interacts with the circuit designer is through these models so development of these models is a major engineering task so the impact of the channel and modulation is id instead of being flat in the saturation region becomes a function of VDS because there is a 1 plus lambda VDS so the lambda factor is there and really as digital designer we really don't care too much about this it's okay fine whatever you know. <laughs> but, but analog designers they really pull their hair out because for them current sources are really important they want current source and what is the ideal current source it has output impedance is infinite output impedance is this you take the AC output impedance is delta V by delta I. Delta V, there is no delta I here for the flat. So, impedance is infinity. So, it is ideal current source. Whereas here, there is a some finite impedance. Pardon? Slope, yeah. This should be lambda. There is a font error. Slope is equal to lambda. Yeah. So, it should have been symbolic font, but looks like it is a some of that got wiped out. You have this, as you are shrinking the channel lens, we have this problems associated uh, with the dependence of threshold voltage on the dimensions, okay, called the short channel effect. And the effect is captured here in this graph. Really what is plotted in this graph is the threshold voltage as a function of the channel length. And uh, the, there are two curves, both are kind of essentially for different VDS values, but kind of, you know, really from a conceptual point of view, they are saying the same thing, which is as I reduce my channel length of the transistor, the threshold voltage of the transistor also reduces. Okay, so that is basically what they are saying. And, uh, you know, so what is the reason again the, the simplest way to uh, try to understand some of these phenomena is to kind of see who controls the gate and how much control they are exercising and what work in some sense work again within quotes okay it is not our rigorous definition of work but just how much potential you need to put on the gate to invert the channel how, how much does that how much potential is required to invert the channel now what happens is when the source drain regions are very close which is what happens when the channel length is small the source drain region help to invert the channel they are so close they are helping so because of that the gate potential needs to be little less to get to inversion so the gate potential starts reducing so what you have is threshold voltage starts reducing now why is this you know why is this important okay well as i said in the last class when you design a transistor to have a certain channel length you might not get exactly that channel length it will be a little bit off because of the physical nature of the manufacturing process. So if it is little less, you get less threshold voltage. So things, okay, it is good, you might say it is faster, but also it is leakier. Which is a little bit more, you get a larger threshold voltage. It is slower and less leaky. So, you know, we said that you have process variations, you have threshold voltage itself which fluctuates due to random dopant fluctuations and so on, but you also have this channel and variations which affects the threshold voltage okay 
not only the channel length, but even the width can affect the threshold voltage, Ex especially very small channel widths. You use the minimum size transistor. In that minimum size transistor, the, you know, the threshold voltage gets influenced by the width. And it really depends on the structure of the transistor. In, in a transistor like this, where you have this kind of a, so now what we are doing is, we are looking at the transistor, <coughs> the channel length is going into the, uh, the, the way we are looking at this particular figure is that this is the width, okay, like this. I am looking at it sideways. The source, imagine the source region is in front of you, drain region is behind you. So the current is flowing either into the slide or coming out of the slide. So we are looking at it from that perspective. And you have this extra region out here, which uh, really what happens is some of the, you know, the voltage on the gate is goes to try to invert this extra region, which is not part of the main channel in some sense. So you have, you know, as you keep reducing the, the uh, width, there's more and more of this extra region you need to invert. Okay, so basically the uh, threshold voltage increases. But then if you have this kind of a structure, then this, you know, you see these regions are kind of the extra regions in the poly, uh, the, in the gate also. The gate when you draw or when you make the gate, a little bit of the gate sticks out of the channel. So those are these regions, okay. They are not over the channel, they are from the side. Whereas in this kind of a structure, these overhang regions help to, invert the channel, okay, because of the nature of the structure out here. So this is called a shallow trench isolation based structure. Pardon? There is no base here. Uh, the question is where is the base? There is no base. It is a source drain and gate. The source, imagine the source is in front, drain is in the back or inverted, doesn't matter. And then body is in the bottom. And so the current is either flowing into or outside. Okay, so that is basically what we are looking at. And so, in this kind of a device, as you reduce the width, the threshold voltage starts reducing. So, one of the things is when you, you know, again, what is the implication? Again, if you use the smallest, typically in designs, uh, we, we use minimum channel length, okay. But widths, we don't use minimum. They can be, the, the widths chosen, they really depend on the drive strength you need. If you need more drive strength, more current, you use larger widths, okay. Uh, but when you use very small widths, perhaps there are places where you really need to use small widths. We will kind of see that later on in some of the circuits we go after. Maybe you want to reduce the width to reduce power because smaller width means smaller current and hence you think it's lower power. But you see it has these kinds of implications. What is the threshold voltage? It really depends on the, especially for very small widths. It really depends on the, the width itself. And any small variation in width will have an impact on the threshold voltage of that transistor. So, you kind of want to be careful when you use these small bits and it can go either way depending on the kind of processing which is done. Just kind of showing, going to show the kind of complexity involved in the actual physical device. Then we have this effect of drain induced barrier lowering. Here basically the drain voltage affects the threshold voltage of the transistor. And the way it affects it is that you know, the basically maybe the, the drain voltage again helps to, if the channel is uh, very small, the drain voltage has an influence in the channel in terms of helping to partially invert the channel. So that is one way of thinking about it. Or you can say there is a band energy, for people who are familiar with energy band diagrams who have taken a basic device physics course, they might recognize this. This is the energy band diagram which essentially tells me the energy of the electron across the channel of the carrier across the channel and for it to cross the channel it has to cross this barrier and the barrier keeps getting bigger or lower based on the gate voltage. Remember that fluid flow model we said we have a wall which prevents the water so that's what this is, the energy band. And the thing is that as I increase my drain source voltage the band starts, you start affecting the shape of the wall. Like it's no longer a rectangle but it becomes curved and then you modulate the height of the wall from the drain region. So effectively what that means is that it's like the threshold voltage itself is getting modulated by the drain voltage. And so you see that in this graph out here. In this graph what we are showing here is the, the drain current 
Okay, just ignore this portion for now. I'll come to that in a few slides. Just look at the portion when Vg is bigger than 0. Okay, that is a normal mode of operation for us. And you have the drain voltage plotted in the log scale. Actually, and then there is a threshold voltage somewhere out here. So, of course, beyond Vg beyond threshold voltage, the transistor is on. That is what we have been kind of talking. Whereas Vg less than threshold voltage, in the ideal model, it's 0, current is 0, but really it is not 0. Okay, there is some current which exponentially depends on the the gate voltage and this is the sub threshold region we will kind of cover that a little bit more in one of the uh, lectures ahead but really because of the exponential nature you have this log of id versus vg is this straight line this the slope of this line is kind of important this slope is about 100 millivolts for every decade increase in current okay the so that means if I want, typically if I want to have, if I say I'm, <coughs> if my VG is close to VT, I'm fully on, then and VG is equal to zero, I'm kind of off, then what this is telling me is that the, the ratio of the on to off current, if I, if I know the slope, I can kind of basically, and if I know the VT, for example, let us say the VT is about 300 millivolts, then every 100 millivolts I have a 10 change in current. So between 0 to 300 millivolts, I have 3 decades change, 1000x. So the current between so-called on and off states is a factor of 1000. So you need about a factor of 1000 current to have proper functioning digital gates. Okay. Now this slope, the value of the slope is kind of very difficult. People try very hard to, you know, to kind of make this slope steeper. Because if I make the slope steeper, I can have smaller threshold voltages, I can have smaller supply, power can go down and all that, because I can shrink everything in the voltage domain, so lower voltages are good. Remember, I still need to maintain about three orders of current difference between on and off. So, you know, so for example, theoretically, you can say that the this slope, the minimum will be about 60 or 65 millivolts. So the lowest, if I want three orders of uh, current difference, then it's 3 times 60, about 180 millivolts. So ideally, if I could get it, then I can reduce my threshold voltage to 180 millivolts and still maintain a good digital operation. But in practice, you find it's about 100 millivolts. So um, when coming back to the drain-induced barrel lowering, what we are saying here is this is a curve for VD equal to 0.1. Remember, we need a non-zero VD. Otherwise, there is no current. It's all zero. So there is a non-zero VD of 0.1 and ID versus VG has this shape. The thing is, when I increase VD, when the VD is going from here from 0 0.1 to 2.7 to 4, the curves are shifting up. I am getting more and more current. Okay, so that is that is explained by this phenomena of band bending and you know modeled as the threshold voltage getting reduced due to the drain source voltage. So if you see out here in the bottom, the threshold voltage is some nominal threshold voltage plus some factor of the source to bulk voltage as the source to bulk voltage becomes positive because of body effect the threshold goes up and as the drain to source voltage goes up threshold goes down so eta is a double coefficient so this is how i can model this for uh, kind of you kind know of looking at the influence of drain source on the threshold so the double really what it does is it increases the current you say, hey, if it increases the current that's good things become faster but you see when i'm supposed to be off my leakage goes up off is when VG is 0, I still have some non-zero current and if my drain to source voltage is instead of 0.1 it is say 1 volt or something or in this case it is 4 volts, let us say it is 2.7 volts then my current goes up in this example by a, f a factor of 10, 10x, the leakage current goes up by 10x, so it is a large variation. So Dibble has an impact especially on the leakage currents of the transistors. So, as we had discussed also in one of the earlier lectures, you want to, to reduce low power, to achieve low power operation, especially when you are not switching, you want to try to get the VDSs to be small, so that you do not get hurt by the dibble effect. Now, you know, there is a, it is kind of a never ending, you know, story where to reduce one effect you do something in the device and then it leads to something else so we'll see that example of that so to reduce the dibble effect what they do is they do this p plus halo implant so try to you know 
uh, compensate for the you know, I'm just kind of just drawing showing it in a very cartoonish way out here right? it really doesn't have the shape but just to kind of show you that by putting this kind of so called halo you can try to minimize the impact of the high drain fields coming because this is the N plus region now you put a P plus you are saying okay go back you know you are pushing the depletion region back right that is your intent it helps to improve DB dibble but you have this no sh phenomena of reverse short channel effect why because now as I reduce my channel length if you see what is happening this P plus is really causing me extra acceptor ion concentration, acceptor ion concentration has gone up because of the P plus. So the gate has to now compensate for this extra acceptor ion concentration. So the threshold voltage goes up. So as I reduce my channel length, instead of this narrow, sorry, the, the normal short channel effect, you have a reverse short channel effect up to a certain point. Of course, beyond that point, if the channel length reduces, again, the whatever we discussed for the normal short channel effect, that effect comes into the picture and the threshold starts reducing. But you see out here that you have a reverse short channel effect. That is, the threshold voltage increases as my channel length is reduced. Okay, so, you know, so what does it mean for a circuit designer? Basically, you know, you suppose you say that, look, you know, I want to, uh, I want to increase the drive strength. Okay, so your friend designed a transistor which has a small W, minimum W because you wanted to reduce power. Then you said, hey, you know, fine, but I want a little bit more speed, let me increase the width a little bit more. Okay, then you have this narrow width effect. Remember, as I said, you know, based on the, uh, the narrow width effect, again, it depends on the transistor geometry. You can have a situation where as you increase the width, the threshold voltage increases. You can either increase or decrease depending on the structure. If you are, if you have a structure of a transistor where the threshold voltage increases with increasing width, your current will actually go down. It is not going to go up, it is going to go down. It is kind of counterintuitive in some sense, but then if you really understand what is going on, you say, yeah, okay, it makes sense because threshold voltage has gone up. Right? And then after some time, the current starts increasing as, as expected. You have a similar phenomena with the <coughs> the short channel effect. As I increase my channel length, if you are in the reverse short channel regime, you are in this regime out here. As you increase the channel length, normally you expect, as I increase my channel length, things should slow down because I have larger transit time, the carriers have to go a longer distance, so current goes down. But because of the impact on the threshold voltage, threshold voltage reduces, the current actually goes up. Of course, up to a certain point after which the business as usual takes over. So these are some of the things which one has to really consider when you really get down to trying to optimize the physical aspects like power, speed and so on, where these detailed physical phenomena have to be really considered, okay, which you don't see if you are just doing normal digital design with ASIC flow and you know writing some Verilog VHDL code and synthesizing. But when you are really, really getting down to transistor level design, which you need to do when you really want to push either speed or lower <coughs> power or both or you are doing analog design, you still need to get down to this level. So then these kinds of detailed understanding of the impact of the transistor's characteristic on the circuit design become really important. So that was one of the main points of this set of slides is to just so that you become aware of these things and uh, uh, you know when you do the design. Temperature has a very interesting effect, okay. You know and you have two contrary effects out here. As you increase the temperature, mobility reduces. Basically, the carriers become very agitated. When you are angry, you do not really make too much progress. Right? I mean, it's just <laughs> not, you're not going anywhere. So the carriers become very agitated. They just hitting, start hitting everyone. So they don't make too much forward progress. So mobility reduces. But at the same time, threshold also reduces. Why threshold is really how, in some sense, at what voltage you invert the channel, and that's related to availability of the 
minority carriers. If my temperature is high, I have more bond breaking, I have more minority carriers, so quickly I can invert the threshold. Lower voltage, I can invert the channel. So threshold voltage reduces as I increase my temperature. So just again from an equation point of view, simple modeling, the mobility is dependence on temperature is given like this, 1 by T, okay, there is some reference temperature and T by TR to the minus K, okay, so K is somewhere between 1 to 2 and threshold voltage as a function of temperature is essentially the threshold voltage at a reference temperature and you can any, you know, linearize the model, any functional relationship for small changes you can always linearize using uh, you know basically you can have the polynomial expansion and just look at the first term linear term so minus b times t minus tr okay so it just has you know about half a millivolt to 3 millivolt per kilo so this is kind of interesting i have current which is a product of mobility times gate overdrive vg minus vt so let us say i increase my temperature and i ignore the threshold voltage I increase my temperature, mobility reduces. So you would expect the current to reduce. Okay. This is what happens at very high voltages. At very high voltages, Vg minus Vt. As I increase my temperature, mobility reduces. Of course, threshold also reduces. So Vg minus Vt goes up. So you have mobility reduction, Vgt going up. But Vgt going up is not much because already Vgt is very large because we are given a very large gate overdrive. It goes up a little bit, but not as much as mobility reduction. And so really overall effect is that the threshold voltage, sorry, the current reduces when I am using very large voltages. Conversely, when I am using very small voltages, VGT is very small. So any change in the threshold voltage shows up as a large effect on the BGT, the gate overdrive, right? Because current is I times, I is equal to mu times some C ox triple by L times VGT to the alpha, right? Alpha is 1 to 2. That VGT is a very important term. So VGT change is much more than the, the, the improvement of VGT is much more than degradation of mobility and, and especially in the sub-threshold regime of operation. We will kind of also see that in the next class when you, you can operate at very low supply voltages. And in those supply voltages, the currents are all given by exponential relationship, okay, e to the e to the VGT. So small change in VGT has a large impact on the current. So at low supply voltages, at low gate source voltages, the inverse effect happens. As my temperature increases, current goes up. Of course, there is a point out here where there is no impact because the mobility change and threshold voltage change kind of balance out. So, so if I have a chip, okay, and you operate a chip at a high supply voltage, then as you as you start heating up the chip, it starts slowing down. The same chip, if you operate at a low supply voltage, below then below this point out here, as you start heating the chip, it will start operating faster. So you see that there is a contrary kind of a very interesting behavior, different kind of behavior, based on what supply voltage you are using. Okay, typically when we were, I mean, you know, the, the designs at least till about five years back were all using reasonably high supply voltages and so on. And so you never really worried about these things. It's like, as you increase the temperature, it will slow down. That's it. You know, because threshold voltage degrades, sorry, the mobility degrades so much that that's really dominates and you don't even bother about this. But now we are entering a regime where people are starting to use low supply voltages in their design. So, if someone asks you which, at when is your chip going to run slow? It depends on the supply. You can't say for sure. <laughs> if you are using a low supply, at high temperature is bad from a speed. Otherwise, low, you know, really it's a, yeah, the answer becomes more, you have to qualify it. Right? So, so, of course, when you are looking at the low supply, the, the low voltage region when you are in the threshold, uh, in the sub-threshold region, in the region where you are looking at, you know, we, we, we looked at the Dibble effect where you have log of ID versus VG, VG is less than the threshold, you have this kind of a linear curve, that curve shifts up. 
as I increase the temperature. Why? Because threshold voltage is going down, so the curve goes up, which means leakage becomes more. So an off device essentially leaks more as the temperature goes up. And uh, so if you see some of these chips, like very uh, high performance chips, which are used in servers, right? You you click on the video, it will go to YouTube for the lecture, which is probably running, you know, of a Google server somewhere, you know, maybe it's a high performance processor and that processor would be, the temperature would be maybe close to 100 degrees centigrade, really, really hot. Whereas maybe in the laptop also, you have seen your laptop, it gets pretty hot outside. So inside the chip also probably it's very close to 85, 90 degrees, 100 degrees. So, uh, you know, the temperature and uh, its impact on the system's performance are really important. In, in fact, a lot of the cloud vendors, so now cloud, you might have heard the term cloud computing, right, where a lot of the companies happening in the cloud. So these data centers, people are actually also looking at places where they can easily cool it. Probably northern Canada, maybe Siberia, you know, these places where you have, anyway, the temperature is very low. So, the that is another aspect which, of course, we don't cover in this course, is these physical, mechanical, thermal aspects, which are very important when you look at the complete system. So, gate-induced drain leakage. So, again, this is a kind of a more a comp kind of a complex phenomena. Uh, basically, you know, when you have it's called jiddle, gate induced drain leakage. You say, I want to shut my transistor off. So I'm going to use, take my gate voltage and make it zero. So my transistor is off. But you find that, you know, say, you take a simple inverter and the output goes high. So there is a VDS and you still have some leakage current. You'll say, okay, I have this leakage current. I really cannot deal with it. Let me make it. Let me try to reduce the leakage more by taking the gate voltage and making it more negative. I really try to pull that curve down by making the gate voltage negative. Unfortunately, it can have, it can be counterproductive. You can have larger leakage and that is what this is showing out here. Normally in this curve, this dashed line is what you would have expected. It coming down and the gate, uh, as you read, make the gate voltage more and more negative, the leakage coming down. But really it starts going up because of gate induced drain leakage. And something to do with the fact that uh, you know, you here you have, when the, it becomes negative, you can actually, this N plus region, remember there is an N plus, in these modern devices, there is an overlap of the gate on the source drain region. So that overlap, you will see, there is an N plus region. So this becomes like a PMOS transistor, small piece of a PMOS transistor here. And you essentially can get into accumulation and then, you know, you can have <coughs> leakages across this junction and so on. So that is called gate induced drain leakage. So one actually cannot look at the gate to source voltage and the gate to drain voltage and cannot see what value it is. And if it's too large, it can lead to extra leakage. Okay. So using negative gate voltage, you would think helps to reduce subthreshold for an NMOS, but it will increase jiddle. Okay. Similarly for the PMOS, larger gate voltages, positive gate voltages can increase increase jiddle. You see these are all second and third, second order phenomena which actually nowadays have become important because of power. You really want very low power, low standby and you find devices are leaking. Then when you start investigating what is happening, all these kinds of physical phenomena have to be accounted for and they explain the extra leakage. So of course gates have become thinner and uh, as we scale down and so you can again have Tunneling, it's a barrier, but still you can have carriers tunnel through across from the channel to the gate. And uh, this is a kind of a problem because normally for a MOSFET transistor, you can have assume the gate is an insulator. So it's like a capacitor. A BJT, you have current from the base to the, the that region, right? 
from the base you can have into the collector emitter region. Whereas MOSFET you do not expect any current, but because thin oxide has become very thin, you can have some current going through it. You know, so some of these previous problems, there were circuit solutions to these. You know, essentially you try to make sure your potentials are correctly placed, jiddle and dibble and so on. Whereas gate leakage, okay, I mean, you know, you can try to reduce the, the gate voltage, you know, clearly anything, any leakage is proportional to voltage. So you want to reduce the voltage, but it's kind of a nasty problem to have. So the way really solution is through device engineering and what people are doing, have done is these modern devices, they have not scaled the oxide thickness that much. But if you don't scale the oxide thickness, then the gates control over the channel becomes weak. To get it back, you increase the dielectric constant of the gate. So that way, even if the gate is farther away physically, because of higher dielectric constant, it still has a good control of the channel, you get a good transistor. So they use basically what is called high K materials, high K dielectrics. This is a term perhaps some of you might have heard. So <coughs> again, uh, you know, you can model this, uh, there is exponential dependence on the oxide thickness because of the tunneling phenomena. And uh, really it is important for modern process, 65 nanometer and below, but not for the older process. Okay. So with that, I come to the end of the today's presentation. Are there any questions? All this has got to do with the engineering of the threshold voltages. So the same thing? Yes. They are Metal gate, yes. Engineering of the work functions and the threshold voltages and so on. To reduce the oxide, uh, to reduce the oxide leakage. Oxide leakage, um, you know, oxide leakage, basically also you need to engineer the, the threshold voltages of the devices and uh, uh, so there are, you know, there are really many, many things going on. For example, the mobility also basically they try to engineer or control by applying strain in the channel by, you know, introducing impurities or kind of alloys like silicon, germanium and so on. Uh, yeah. Work function. Yeah, so due to difference in barrier heights, that's what we say out here. So, uh, so again, see the these energy bands kind of depend on the uh, the materials and so on and how it's processed. So, for example, the polysilicon could be n plus for the because the way you're doping, the way they make it. When you do a n plus implant, you get a n plus polysilicon. When you do a p plus implant, you get a p plus polysilicon. So the Fermi levels, the work functions are a little different, right? So the barrier heights will be different. <coughs>